We ready? Yep. All right. <sighs> Big money. Do it. No whammies. What oh my God. <laughs> Whoa. Welcome back to Human Reaction, your weekly source for independent commentary on news, culture, and politics. <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> Welcome back to Human Reaction, your weekly source for commentary, independent commentary, some kind of commentary, whatever, fuck it. Welcome. <laughs> I, I don't know how we do this. Welcome back to Human Reaction. Your weekly? Welcome back to Human Reaction, your weekly source for independent commentary on news, culture, and politics, where it is always our mission to arm you with the, the tools. <laughs> you shouldn't have made that face. It looked like you were laughing. No, I was trying not to laugh. <laughs> it's like every time you start talking or stop talking, it's. Just... You know what? Oh, Fuck man. it. We'll do it live, okay? Hey, welcome back to Human Reaction. This is the show you thought it was. We're glad you're here. We're going to talk about some news today, okay? Listen, we got an impact driver next door. It's driving us fucking crazy. Here's what we're going to talk about. We got some new updates. We got some new updates and perspectives from the Israel-Hamas conflict that we will cover. The judge in the D.C. case has imposed a gag order on Trump. Turns out he's into kinky things like that. <laughs> and Arkansas governor bans the Chinese firm uh, from owning land in the state. So we're going to get into all the complexity there as well. Here to talk about all these things and more, David Rand. Uh, what was his name again? <laughs> you forgot your own intro to make fun of me, and I, I got to provide you with I it. Di I didn't write it down. I'm sorry. No. John, J <laughs> Johnny Sins. Johnny Sins. Johnny Sins lookalike. Yeah. David's mm. Halloween costume this year will be Johnny Sins. Just gotta, I got to get an astronaut uh, or a doctor's uh, thing. or There's so many options. Pizza box. Yeah, I could literally be Johnny Sins for every Halloween. I, re I recommend not Googling that. I do have to shave. <laughs> no, that's the only trade-off. It doesn't have beard. Often. Anyways. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyways, Kyle Mack, how are you doing? Uh, back from uh, vacation, I see. Yeah, freshly back from Europe. I'm glad to be back. I heard you guys covered this whole situation that's been going on very thoroughly. We tried. We did our best. Uh, we, we missed your, you know, your input, but we're glad to have you. Better late than never. I yeah. mean, I, 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 all I want to <laughs> say is, you know, we, we really needed our former Jew on, on staff. <laughs> to cover these things for us so i'm not going to explain explain that if you want to know what that means you got to join the discord and kyle will explain it to you <laughs> my name is joe sheehan i am what did i say i was again classically woke and politically non-binary and if you want me to explain what that means you can join the discord as well all right let's get into this stuff you guys enough of the uh enough of the this, has been, a, this has been a cursed intro it yeah, really has it intro. really has it's it's insane in fact i, I do want to redo it because it's just absolutely terrible and people that I care about watch this show now. In yeah. fact, I had someone tell uh, tell me today that they like the sound of our voices. Oh, really? Yeah. And I was like, That's damn, awesome. no one has ever told me that before. Yeah. I never got a compliment on my voice before. I got a, now I'm all conscious of it though. <laughs> but no, we got a lot of great feedback from the last episode. Uh, people called me and were like, hey, that was a great episode. I was like, thank you. Thank you. And it was funny. The second one got a lot of great, I got more than one call on. Uh, and it was more like the... It was different, right? The first one was really covering the facts, and the other one was more of our prescriptions and thoughts about it. Uh, and people were sort of like, hey, no one's ever said that kind of perspective on it before. And I was like, nice. Cool. I just want to see that. Yeah. I mean, the last thing we want to, we want to be is any more noise in an ocean of uh, uh, what is, you know, just a lot of uh, hot takes and, and really, I mean, difficult you know, analysis of a very complex situation. We want to be providing value and adding clarity. Uh, not the opposite. So uh, thanks again, David, for all the hard work you put into that episode. Absolutely. What do we have that's new about the conflict now since we put out those episodes? Yeah, so we got a, uh, the update is we are sitting at the count on how many Israelis died in the attack. And what the breakdown was still isn't very clear. I haven't seen anything that points out how many were soldiers versus civilians yet. I've been looking, but haven't found that. But we're still sitting about 1,400 casualties is the, is the estimate. Uh, for the Gaza Palestinians, we're at 2,650 killed, um, about 12,000 injured. Uh, and then in the West Bank, we have 81 deaths. So the some of the kind of highlights for that is a lot of these are houses and things like that that are being hit by Israeli rockets. Um, one of them, unfortunately, was a UN school where six people were killed. Uh, it's quite 
you know, controversial, right? This is a international school for kids. It's one of the few areas, according to some reports I was looking at, that was specifically to fight back on Islamification in, in the education system within uh, Gaza that creates the kind of videos you see of, you know, these tiny Palestinian kids saying horrendous things about the Jewish people. Uh, real tragedy that that was one of the things that was blown up. Um, and then there's the propaganda war. That's the update really for the week uh, beyond a couple of the things I've developed in the international community, but we'll start there. I don't know if you guys heard, but the Arab Baptist Christian hospital um, blew up and then it was just the parking lot. And then like a lot of people died, but then there was like this weird press release that they did around all these corpses that was really, and they had like hospital gowns on and then they haven't really seen the corpses since. And it's, it's, it's very strange. Um, so can I just clarify that real quick? So, yeah. so there was the, there was the breaking news it was a few days ago as of the recording of this podcast that a hospital was hit. Right. And there was a lot of media around this hospital being hit. And there was a, a big, a big story obviously because a, a ton of innocent civilians in there. Right. And then, it w- was it a couple of days later that it, the narrative no. changed? It, no, within hours. Within hours. And, and, and you know, there's the certain amount for the Israelis to take some ownership here and a certain amount for, I think, bad actors on the Hamas side. So the Israeli defense did not do a good job about their own defense of themselves as the ones who perpetrated it. So the original report that came out that was then run by the New York Times was the Israelis have blown up this hospital and... I don't know where that information came from. I think it was from the Palestinian Health Authority, if I remember right. Well, and I, I think if I remember correctly, too, Israel said they were going to strike the hospital prior to that. Well, they? no. Okay, so the hospital had been struck earlier, not by direct attack. Yeah. Right? Yeah, because um, they put out the order for the evacuation from the hospital at, at some point, but then they never did anything about it. So that was accused by some people, uh, and there were other situations where the hospital was consequentially attacked by something across the street and things like that that were being hit. Um, but I, I haven't found anything that authenticated that, that the hospital itself was said to be destroyed. I mean, don't get me wrong. If Israel wants to destroy a building, they can level the building, right? In fact, there's actually, once you get into the details of Hamas's strategy using tunnels, the destruction of buildings isn't really the goal. The point is not to destroy the building. It's to collapse the the entry into the tunnel that is underneath the building. If you're Hamas, the last thing you do is walk out in the open area where the drones are. What you do is you go below ground. And we'll get into that a little bit later because that's something that we didn't talk about last time. And hopefully this time, I'm hoping we could talk a little bit about the strategic pretzel we're currently in, it, that Israel's currently in. And how that is kind of exasperated by all the conditions. But, you know, the, the both sides are blaming each other. Uh, so getting back to the kind of propaganda war, Israel's, you know, some, some people who are on Israel's side put out some videos to supposedly disprove that it was them, but then they weren't from the right year. And so that really set off a lot of alarm bells. So it was like, whoa. And then, and then after that, it was a, another set of things with the, the Palestinian, the Hamas, Palestinian group, I'm not sure who it was. I don't think it was Moss actually um, pulled off a press release in the so-called in like the, the ruins of the hospital with all these dead bodies around everywhere in bags. But then like that person disappeared and hasn't spoken since um, this was all over nighttime. And then once the day came, you get all these pictures of the actual uh, hospital and it's fine. Not fine. That's not right. An explosion went off in its parking lot and there was like, collateral destruction from that, but it wasn't like it got hit by a, a, a large rocket. The strange thing about that is a lot of the video reported to be the attack had these huge plumes of fire. Mm-hmm. So people were very confused, right? They're looking at the plumes of fire. They're, they're hearing it. And it's like, it sounds like a major munition, right? So the accusation from Israelis was this was a rocket that they were shooting at, at, at Israel that failed, which happens sometimes, right? These are homemade rockets and it landed on the hospital. Right. And then it was like, well, it actually didn't land on the hospital. And everyone agreed, oh, no, it didn't land on the hospital. We don't know where that came from. It landed in the parking lot. And then there was all these deaths. Well, it makes sense for people to die in the hospital parking lot. You know why? Because there are 12,000 injured people. The hospital is very full. And second, a lot of people don't sleep indoors right now. 
Why? Because if you're going to die, you'd rather die from being hit and you just go to sleep and you never wake up versus being trapped in concrete for four or five days before you die of thirst. That is awful. Yeah. If that's the choice, a lot of people are like, I'm just going to sleep outside. So like that could have been where a lot of those deaths came from, but we're still, it's like, it's very unconfirmed. Well, and one so, of the reasons why is because Israel's keeping press out, right? Not only for their safety, but like from a lot of the operational side. Uh, and then, um, and then Palestinian press, you, you're always wondering how reliable it is. Some of these guys are very sold for the Palestinian cause to the point where I, you can't trust them not to lie a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm, I, I've grown convinced of that through this story that, um, there are several people who look like legit reporters who are more than willing to lie to you in order to get the result they want. Are these American news outlets? Are these international? Are they Palestinian based? Israeli? What? What? International for the most part. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we're talking like AP or what? Yeah. That's not really where you're getting this information, right? Because AP, that's not how I've seen this. Most of this is on X, right? This is, this is internet drama on X. Okay. Um, so, so these are people who are essentially trying to act as journalists by way of or they're legit like the authors internet. and journalists and things like that yeah yeah and, and don't but wrong. they're on the ground some of them not some all of them <laughs> you know some of them are you know know people in palestine and they're getting information they're and they're copying out um so yeah. and and are they publishing like videos from those sources inside the country who are trying to share things that are going on you know, yeah. or what they think is that's the best that. lens on it okay. for sure. And then the, you know, and then, and then the other side on the other side, like you can't put it past Israel, right? They've been caught bombing some pretty tr- atrocious targets, denying it. And then months later saying, ah, actually it was us after an international investigation. What you need to really know what's going on. That's why everything that's happening right now, everyone should hold at arm's length is you need a unbiased third party. Of course, that isn't literally designed to lie to you. I think the thing that people that that we're all maybe learning to a greater degree or that we could stand to learn in this situation to a greater degree is that there are people on both sides who are going to frame the events that are occurring to best benefit their side in this conflict. Right. And there's not a lot of impartiality in that because it is just so chaotic and hectic and there there are such strong emotions and motivations on both sides, right? Correct. And also important to realize that your favorite influencer on a given political subject doesn't know what's going on either. Like they're just filling in information that confirms to their bias. And it might be pro-Palestinian, might be pro-Israel, whatever. Like we're all operating in the fog of war right now. Yeah. And it's, it's like you said, Dave, like pretty much almost every single occurrence that I've come across here of like this bomb was struck here, this missile was struck here. They've all been old footage. Like, it'll be like, oh, that's from 2018. That's from 2010. That's from 2014. Like, almost every single one has been that way. A a lot of the babies and stuff like that, like those things, those are all from previous conflicts that had occurred. Mm. No. That I'm coming. A a lot are AI generated, too. Well, are you talking about the Ben Shapiro one? Yes. Yeah, that didn't turn out to be actually. That didn't turn out to be AI generated? What they figured out was that uh, part of the... uh, This was after a lot of forensic analysis, Mm -hmm. right? What they figured out is if you... If you just do, like, a tighter analysis of the actual subject matter it doesn't trigger but when you go out where you get like the there's like a nurse with like a a band on with a qr code that's been blurred out then it detects ai so like there's a Mm. lot of detail with that sort of thing that people are using to say ben shapiro is lying about this don't get me wrong i think ben shapiro is a ghoul when when, when it comes to this issue (laughs) yeah he has been it's wild but as far as, and what I mean by that is specifically and intentionally saying anyone who doesn't agree with his point of view hates Jews. That's very disturbing and anti free speech to me. And two, saying, look, you know, like Israel wouldn't lie to us. <laughs> it's like, well, wait, I think Israel's capable of lying in order to get what they want, especially if what they're saying is what they mean, which is this is war. In which case, if it's war, you lie to your allies to get them involved in the war oh, to yeah. support your cause. It and and Israel's Israel had a history that. of doing this, or yeah. Mossad in specific has had a history of doing this in yeah. the past, of creating certain situations that bring people into the conflict. Right. So what we might be able to convey to our viewers and listeners is, is maybe an eighth maxim per se, right? Uh, maybe wait 72 hours before making any sort of social media comment on a new breaking story. Maybe, right? maybe wait three years before making a comment. Because, <laughs> Sometimes because that. most of these things aren't going to really be known for years, probably. But at very least, you know, until there's 
the light of day, for right. example, to get to actually see the aftermath of something going on. Like just, just be careful what you sign your name to, right? Because you're really, you're, you're, you're signing your name to a narrative when you publish something. And if it's not true, then you're undermining your own credibility, mm. right? So don't be, just don't be like a, you know, a, a basically a puppet um, megaphone for a narrative that may or may not even be true. Right. Yeah. So the international community uh, has taken several actions so far this week that I think if we didn't talk about, and I know it's kind of boring, but I do think it's very important. The U.S. and allies have killed a U.N. security resolution to create a ceasefire in Gaza. Um, on the pro side of this was Russia, China, the UAE, Mozambique, and Gabon. Uh, the anti side was France, Japan, UK, and the US. The abstain side was Brazil, interesting, Ecuador, and <laughs> unsurprisingly, Switzerland. Because it's Switzerland. That's what they do. <laughs> it's, 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 Bunch of fences. It is kind of funny, though. It is funny. It's dark funny, but it's funny. Um, <laughs> And the ceasefire question is an interesting one, right? Because the the U.S. role here is to say no in Israel's absence without being on the Security Council currently because they're our ally. The question is, is without a plan, why not? And I think we'll get more to like, what is the plan here? Like, are, are, like do we know how many Hamas have you killed versus how many Palestinians? Like questions like that that should be asked if the U.S. is going to act in the favor of Israel pursuing this vendetta that they're doing, which I think is a totally legit vendetta, right? Go after the guys who killed your guys. I get it. Um, but we need to ask a lot of important questions, I think, if we're going to use our political capital to back them in this way. And another one was actually a UN resolution to get humanitarian aid into Gaza. Because there's a lot of people have been bombed out of their homes and they're just living in the streets and in the desert and they don't have access to water or food and stuff like that. Well, and what, what happened with that? That was voted down? That also got voted down, yep. The humanitarian aid got voted down yep. by the same... You know, uh, I didn't actually look at the block voting on that one, but yeah, I assume... I'd be really to curious be. to know, and I, I would love to look that up if you don't have it, you know, too, yeah, too right far here. buried. Who votes against humanitarian aid for civilians? That, to me, seems pretty atrocious. It was a Brazil resolution called for humanitarian pauses to deliver aid. Would have helped avoid Tuesday explosion at the Gaza, Gaza hospital. It's only a ceasefire that'll help do this. That's actually a good point. If you have a ceasefire, occasional ceasefires, then you have an opportunity to go in and establish things like who so, built this hospital, which is a war crime. To be clear, like oh, that's blowing illegal. up the hospital is a war crime. Yeah, yeah. Uh, surprise, surprise. Yeah. Um, yeah as well, it should be. The well, Russia, so, so hold on. Had, let me just let me just clarify something really quick. Um, so you're saying it's possible that the humanitarian aid piece was voted down because the the ceasefire resolution was voted down, and it's not safe to send you know humanitarian aid or peacekeepers in to deliver that while there's like active fighting going on is that i think the right way to say it would be there were two different resolutions one for a ceasefire one for humanitarian aid. the humanitarian aid included it was not dependent upon the ceasefire one it basically called for certain periods of pause and aggressions to get aid in and out or not out but aid in so the pauses in aggression are built into the humanitarian yep. resolution Got i don't it. see any easy list but it looks like a pretty similar list to the other vote too Brazil uh, actually wrote the humanitarian aid one, though. Um, that's a good question. Very interesting. I wonder why countries would vote against that. That's that's troubling. Yeah, sorry. I don't have a list on that one. That's um, right. So, and then the next one from the international community that's currently happening is there's a lot of questions about around where the weapons came from. Now, if you... Got up today on Thursday, uh, you would have seen a gazillion. Everyone wrote a story this morning about how some of the weapons were from North Korea. Uh, that seems to be true with some of the rockets, like heavy weaponry that they had, um, mostly like over shoulder mounted like rockets uh, and RPGs. The question that a lot of people that I've seen been asking since the beginning, and this is a big difference between Hamas's capability from the early 2000s to today, is the amount and sophistication of their small arms weaponry. I'm talking about the AK sometimes, but also like M4s with like an ACOG on the top, like a nice sight and like, you know, nice accessories built in. Like you're like, wow, this this guy is packing. Um, well, so, I mean, we did leave a bunch of military equipment in Afghanistan when we withdrew, right? Is there 
potential that came from there? That's or? something we stipulated a lot a little bit last time. And I mentioned Ukraine, but what I want to note is that uh, Redacted, which is a YouTube channel you can find, there's a lot of independent media reporting, had a pretty high quality um, on the ground investigative reporting by a guy in Russia and Ukraine on this issue of the international arms deals of weapons that are being given to Ukraine flowing out of the country. And he has people on camera who were saying, I saw this happen. Big deal. Uh, and it came out like two days ago. And I mean, it made a splash, but not nearly as big as the splash about North Korean weapons, which to me. Wait, is, what about North Korean weapons? Sorry, North Korea has the larger arm weapons, meaning like the over shoulder mounted rockets. The smaller weapons, which is what this guy's talking about, those, you know, could have come from Ukraine. Gotcha. Because, the, and, and, and it's, and he specifically, it's, it's, it's really well done. People should check it out. We should link it in the in the show notes. We will do that. Please. Um, can't get into it all now, but uh, I do, uh, if we at some point want to make a, I don't know, a monologue or something like that, that might make sense because it's too long a story to tell here. Next up is Hezbollah. All right. So I want to remind everybody what Hezbollah is. Hezbollah is the Shia um, kind of terrorist faction that operates north of Israel. Uh, not in the Gaza Strip, which is controlled by Hamas, not in the West Bank, which is controlled by the Palestinian Authority or PA. Hamas operates mostly out of Israel to the north of Israel, which is um, uh, Lebanon. Mm -hmm. uh, I always want to say Lebanon, but that's the place in Oregon. It's Lebanon. I don't know. So uh, they've been shooting thousands of rockets in Israel. I couldn't find any specific like casualties from that. Uh, and Israel has been airstriking back into Lebanon, um, hitting several like villages and stuff. Um, they have said, and this is the kind of part of like the log jam that's happening that looks a lot like the machinery that created world war one. So you got a lot of people who have made public statements and stake their reputation to the, the, to the Muslim world about this that might trigger a cascading effect. So one, uh, it is said that if Israel does an on the ground invasion of Gaza with ground troops, they will attack. So that's the trick with that that Israel currently face. In the north, they have Hezbollah. In the south, they have Hamas. Hamas the Gaza Strip, if you remember the, flat, the map from last time, has one end of most of it's the sea. The rest is Israel on two sides, and the bottom side is a border with Egypt. Egypt actually controlled the Gaza Strip for some time before uh, Israel took control of it. Um, so... They've said if Israel goes on the ground in an attack, they will go in. Israel has been calling their tanks to the Gaza Strip with all these reservists, like 300,000 reservists, remember right? So it looks like they're building up for a ground invasion of Gaza. This is not a big area. Remember, five miles by 25 miles. We have, uh, we have said that Hezbollah invades, we will get involved, probably with the War Powers Act. So the War Powers Act basically said back in the 60s, I want to say, the War Powers said the, the president can go to war for 90 days without congressional approval in order to protect the United States. So people are now already making the argument, like trying to build the intellectual edifice to justify getting involved from that angle. And then Hezbollah specifically attacked a U.S. base in Syria yesterday. So once again, they want to draw us into this war. The part of the goal here is Hamas attacks Israel, causes international outrage. Israel attacks Hamas and the Palestinians. Civilians die. The a hospital allegedly gets bombed. That night when the hospital was reported to have been bombed, you had uprisings happen all over the place. Turkey, Baghdad, all over the place. I mean, every major you know Muslim majority country was outraged and got into the streets and some pretty nasty things happened that we don't, it just don't have the time to get into, but like it's, it was some rioting and uh, bases attacked and embassies and stuff like that all over the place. Has this been confirmed too? Didn't Israel hit a Syrian airport? You know, I saw that and then I wasn't able to get into the details before yeah. the episode. So I saw a lot of people reporting on that. I don't yeah. know if it was ever confirmed or not. Um, cause it, it's it something to do with, uh, weapons shipments to Hezbollah. Yeah. Something about? like that. Yeah. Yeah. So the, um, yeah, so there, there's a very fluid dynamic situation going on, but this is the, the, the structure that's kind of arising is you have this, 
this, remember the logic of terrorism. It's the action is in the reaction. So if I provoke you to attack me, then I have a clearer cause of war to inspire the Muslim masses to join in the war, right? We can understand this and recognize this. If you march NATO up to the borders of Russia and then they invade, you have a cause of war, right? Where you can say, we have a just war on our side. We're being defensive. Um, you, similar story here, cause a reaction, cause lots of civilian deaths. Note the disproportionality. I'm not saying that this is a good argument. I'm just saying this is the argument of Israeli deaths to Palestinian deaths and say these guys are the bad guys. And then Palestinians rise up and, and, and Arabs everywhere rise up and, and, and attack, right? Um, so part of the goal is to get America involved. And it looks like we're feeding into it. We have 2,000 Marines and a carrier strike group which is a enormous amount of material um, and commitment from the US military to into the region. Uh, theoretically, it's a show of support and to deter Iran from getting engaged directly is their supposed mission. Uh, meanwhile, the neocons, Lindsey Graham and all those guys are shaking the rafters with their calls to go, with, go to war with Iran right now. And they have been since the day after the attack, to be clear. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't, there was no pause. There was no investigation. There was no anything. It was the day after Wall Street Journal things drops and everyone says time to go to war with Iran. So this feels wrong to me. Yeah. And, and we had a lot of presidential candidates saying it too. Like uh, Nikki Haley was, um, uh, Mike Pence was, I know for sure. Mm -hmm. I think Christie was too. Um, not where's, sure about Christie, but. Where's our boy Vivek on all this right now? He's the only good one on it so far. Yeah. Really? He did a really great interview with okay. Tucker Carlson. Tr Articulate Trump's been you. fairly measured too, from what I've seen, mm -hmm. but um, Vivek, in my opinion, has been the best on this. Um, everyone else, though. It's just neocon central, <laughs> like yeah. which, which, and and then I think I do think some people, not for presidential election, I mean for just like generic Republicans, have issued support for Israel, and that's been identified as uh, therefore they want to go with the war with Iran. I don't think that's true. That's that there's a there's a overinflated reaction from both uh, pro peace libertarian types and pro peace leftists that are like, well, you support Israel, then you want to go to war with. It's like, no, yeah, that's that's too far. All right. although, yeah. although I, I think the, a lot of like the, the ad, average population of the Republican Party, I think really just doesn't understand the conflict. Like yeah. they're just hearing a bunch of scary Arabic names and they don't really know where they fit into all this. And they're just like everybody versus Israel kind of a thing. Yeah. So there's a gut reaction that exists there. Yeah. And, and they need to play for that. I mean, election year is coming up and, and, and it's, and it's right to say, I support Israel in their time of need as they hunt down Hamas who killed all these people. I totally get that. So if you're just, you know, so the problem is like, then you, then you end up having a lot of people are just conflating with like Hamas with 2 million Palestinians in the Gaza right. Strip. And it's just like, and I'm seeing pretty direct calls from a lot of like conservative influencer types that are basically just saying like, we got to genocide some people. Well, uh, yeah, yeah. Let me like, give you a good example. They're not saying it that way, but that's effectively. Or, and is, and there's right? a whole philosophy of act mm -hmm. now, sort the bodies out later sort of thing that's going on in Israel. Mm -hmm. And I think is echoed by uh, some folks in the United States. I think that's absolutely mm -hmm. true. Like, for example, you got uh, Jacob Nagel, who was the uh, served to the prime minister uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, Secret uh, National Security Advisor, said, I don't give a damn. It's much more important to act and finish the problem, and then we can decide what to do. When asked, what are we going to do after the bombing? Is the bombing helping? What's going to happen after the bombing? How do we actually get, you know, like solve the problem of Hamas? I used to say, think then act. What happened this weekend changes all the rules of, uh, of play, added Nagel. His views are echoed by Israeli military and political leaders across the political spectrum. That's from MSN, right? There is a, there's a pitch right now, and it's a very dangerous one going on in Israel. And what you want is to say, of course, to be righteous in their anger, right? I, I, that's what they are going for, right? And I, I do get it. Uh, but also, like, don't make the same mistakes that we made after 9-11, Right, where you put yourself into a, a terrible circumstance where you know it takes you forever to, to bring the person to justice, where you wind up doing a bunch of things you wouldn't otherwise do, um, and then and then there's just and one of the narratives this week that was really good was that begging, making him defend that point of view and action like, well, is the bombing campaign going to work? Is it actually going to get rid of Moss? What are we going to do next? What's the next thing? How do we actually finish this thing so we don't just you know do the thing that we've been doing for literally sixty years? And then claiming that's that's what that's that's working, 
right? Because this obviously hasn't worked before. There was violence before Hamas, you know, was created in the 1970s, which we'll get into. And then there was the, you know, and there was there's been violence since and nothing's really stopped it. So how do we stop this cycle of violence? Well, and there was also another clip that was going kind of getting passed around X from a decade ago of uh, Pat Buchanan talking about uh, there was some major event that had happened on the Gaza Strip at yeah. the time. And he was just saying and he was saying, you got to be very careful what happens when these kids grow up. And right. it's like now we're at the point where those kids have grown up. Right. right? It's, it's what's called terrorist math. Mm-hmm. If you kill one person, you inspire five more to take up arms against you. Uh, and this is the classic problem that America has faced in every asymmetrical war we've engaged in as the non-symmetrical partner. Um, and so we're, we're oh, Israel's had this indetractable problem for a long time, and their solution has been to isolate Gaza and then try to break up uh, West Palestine, right, the Western Bank, mm-hmm. right? And so that solution to isolate Gaza hasn't worked, right? It's bred 2.5 million Palestinians who all have pretty good reason not to like Israel, right? So how do you try to change that calculus? Um, Jocko Willock had a great podcast this week where basically he says like, look, we got to balance this, stop the bombing now, put in humanitarian aid, and then, then re-engage operations that are more targeted. And I think what he means is ground. But then he says like, there's a huge trade-off there, a mass of you know, like very terrible cash flows. This is one of the dudes who led Fallujah, you know, and, you know, engagements like that in Iraq. Um, so he knows what he's talking about. Definitely check it out. Uh, it was on um, the Unraveling, his new Unraveling mm-hmm. podcast with that cat from, um, oh, what's it called? Martyr Maid. Mm. Yeah. So uh, one of the questions, and we got a lot of questions in from Discord. So join our Discord community. Uh, I want to hit some of those. So because, you know, obviously we took a big stab at it. We made two videos to try to get people up to date and then talk about a lot of the implications and give some mental models. What we didn't do is explain everything because there's just so much to explain. We've got a hundred years of history, guys, a hundred. Uh, and we're not going to give that. You can find those online. I recommend you educate yourself about the history here because it is uh, depressing and fascinating at the same time. Not to put you on the spot, but do you have any good, uh, you know, objective sources for that sort of thing? Because I know that like Wikipedia can be convenient, but it's not always the most impartial. There are certainly biases present there. You got to watch more than one, for sure. Just I mean, kind of like, compare and you contrast. Gotta, yeah, yeah. Find yourself a solid one from AJ or, you know, um, what's AJ? Oh, oh, Algae Zero Plus on YouTube or something like that. Um, gotcha. That's a great. I mean, like, I mean, if you're you don't want to read, um, the, you know, if you got if you got book length time, they got real good books out there uh, that try to balance this out. You can find lots of Israelis writing true histories of the Israeli-Palestine conflict. Maybe we'll um, put a couple of good perspectives uh, yeah. for books in the show notes. Yeah, and one thing is I cannot retain the authors. That's one of the problems here because they all have like these, the Jewish names is hard for me to keep in my head. So uh, yeah, That's I'll give you because you're racist. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm just, <laughs> I just I'm a typical American. I just, cannot, I just cannot retain foreign languages. I'm just, I'm terrible with it. That's right. You have other strengths. We, we love you for other reasons. Right, right, right. I can draw some supply and demand graphs. Um, <laughs> okay, so... Why wasn't Israeli intelligence able to detect Hamas's plan to attack, but was able to detect the weapon shipments leading them to bomb Lebanon and Syria this week? Excellent question, Adam. I have no idea. But what we do know is that the attacks took two years of planning. So there should have been evidence, Drew. We do know that Egypt warned them, and then it was kind of like, ah, maybe, maybe not. Um, we do know that America also detected, leading up to it, um, some signals intelligence that required that something was going to happen. Um, and, you know, we do know that one of the claims by Hamas is how it worked is because they did put out a disinformation campaign, right? And imagine these different disinform- disinformation campaigns. It's literally like me calling Kyle with you listening and be like, you know, the new trainer we have, he's just not showing up to work lately. And, you know, I don't know, everyone, the troop morale is really low and everyone just kind of wants to be done. And I'm just like giving you what you want to hear. And that might be what happened. Like they just really thought that they were the, the campaign to demoralize Hamas and the, and the Palestinians uh, was working, perhaps. Not sure. Don't know that for sure, but that's been one of the accusations. And then you know, one of the, one of the, it's just like, they were, they, they missed this, but then when it comes to the bombing of that hospital, they had a response within 20 minutes. And then within a few hours, they had a signals correspondence. They had recorded two people who are supposedly Hamas talking on the phone about it. 
and supposedly admitting to it. Although there was some controversy about the translation to admitting to it. Mm, yeah. That was also out there. So um, I'm not going to say that's a smoke and gun situation, but it is interesting that they were able to get that, but not detect this. There's also been um, some open-ended questions uh, from folks about the um, about whether or not there was an order to stand down, what that means. Uh, especially from um, Charlie Kirk, who asked this question of uh, Patrick Ben David on his podcast. I've been Israel many times. The whole country's a fortress. When I first heard this story, I still had the same gut instinct that I did initially. I find this very hard to believe. I've been to that Gaza border. You, you cannot go 10 feet without running into a 19 year old with an AR 15 or an automatic machine gun that is an IDF soldier, right? The whole country is surveilled. And so, so let, me let me just kind of go through this. We don't talk about Israeli politics very often, and most Americans don't know this. The last nine months, Israel was on the brink of civil war. It's not an exaggeration. This judicial stuff, there were, there were hundreds of thousands of Israelis taking to the streets because Bibi Netanyahu was basically redefining the Israeli constitution. That's not an exaggeration, right? He said the judicial branch has too much power. There were protests planned this week against Netanyahu where they anticipated tens of thousands of people to take to the streets. That's all gone, Patrick. Netanyahu now has an emergency government and a mandate to lead. I'm not, I'm not willing to say, to go so far that saying that Netanyahu knew or there was intelligence here. But I think some questions need to be asked. Was there a stand-down order? Whew. Was there a stand-down order? Six hours? I don't believe it. Israel's the side of New, size of New Jersey. When I took a helicopter ride from Jerusalem to the Gaza border, it's 45 minutes. Wow. Six hours. They're live streaming the killing of Jews. Was Did somebody in the government say stand down? That is a legitimate non-conspiracy question. The whole country is the IDF. <laughs> the whole country is. Yeah. And you're trying to tell me that they're going to concerts and kibbutzes and schools? Really good questions from Mr. Kirk um, about why was the response quite what it was? I mean, I have no good answers. And I haven't seen anything that really answers it satisfactorily it, it does raise an interesting point to me too of a, a few where do the incentives lie on both sides of of this in the initial attack like what was hamas's original goal by going in paragliding in like this like what 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 are they trying to accomplish with this so the motive is probably the terrorist logic motive which is the actions and the reaction meaning do something outrageous proved that the fourth most powerful military in the world can't stop you, uh, inspire the Muslim world to action against the West. Those are kind of the, I would say the three main. Mm. Yeah, because then there's an, an added thing of like, if we're to follow this train of logic with Charlie, and I, I think it is valuable question there, is what is the incentive for the stand down order and allowing this to happen? If there was. If, if, if there was. Yeah, I mean, it's to obviously to rally around the flag effect, right? Yeah. If you're thinking conspiratorially and, you know, there have been people who said that this isn't the first time Benjamin Netanyahu wasn't uh, near an election and uh, mm -hmm. something controversial happened. Uh, he, he was, he had, he has like major problems too. He himself as a politician had several uh, accusations of corruption and stuff like that. I don't really know the status of those or the details, but I've read that as well. So it's, it's, it's very... I'm not saying it was an inside job. We're not saying that. We're just saying we're just saying the Israel has a lot of questions that they have to ask their government. Well, and, and th there is a history of inside jobs that have occurred in relation to these types of things. If we're to follow the same logic, like back in the early statehood of Israel, the defense minister, uh, his name was Levon. It's called the Levon affair. He was actually fired for this. Was that they were going around planting bombs in like American and British owned uh, facilities, like schools, hospitals, uh, libraries in Egypt, and in or and then blaming it on the Muslim Brotherhood in order to start pulling the higher powers in, right? Which was British and the Americans at the time. Like, so like, and he was, he was fired over this, like this guy, but this was back in the fifties. Um, yeah, there's Mr. Levon right there. So like, it is, it is an interesting question of like, it's not like this hasn't happened before, you mm -hmm. know, like the CIA has floated around these ideas with like operation, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the, the Cuban, the Cuban one, Operation whatever Northwoods. it was, Northwoods. They flo floated around these ideas before, and I wouldn't be surprised if higher governments aren't doing these types of things uh, 
like or the intelligence agencies aren't doing these types of things normally another one for people to check out if you're if you want to keep your conspiracy hat on and, and have a good time looking at covert operations that isn't so covert was the uss liberty uh this is the story of a u.s um a destroyer i believe it was i have a hard time reading it from here uh that you know was attacked by israeli warplanes uh and under the supposed potential um, uh, motivation to get the U.S. to enter into uh, war with the other Arab states that they were uh, in conflict with, that Israel was in conflict at the time. Mm. So is this fairly well substantiated, or is this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, the Wikipedia page is like does a lot of the job for you. Like, it's it's very clear that the attack happened. That it was an Israeli ship, and there isn't really clear. That this obviously is Israel's like oh it was an accident that sort of thing but you're you're wondering you know that, that when you look at the facts it becomes harder and harder to well it, it's just uh, worthy of uh, of com- a conversation point is like Mossad is a very savvy intelligence operation like they're them and the CIA are like the top dogs when it comes to intelligence uh, the intelligence apparatus globally so like the things that they're willing and I, I've I've heard this from intelligence people before where it's like there's certain like scrupulations that uh like uh, the CIA usually is only willing to go so far they kind of there is certain moral codes I've been told that Mossad is much more by any means necessary in the way that they approach things so it, it just it, I wouldn't like I'm not saying that this is what happened but I wouldn't put it past them We'll find out in three years or, <laughs> if, or if 30. We do, if we do, yeah. ever, right? <laughs> the uh, uh, unclassification is tough to do in the United States, much less in Israel. Yeah. Sure. So, What are so, some of the other questions yeah. from Discord? Uh, why does no one seem to care about the Christians that live in Gaza? You might be surprised to know that there are many Christian Palestinians, much less mm-hmm. Christians in Gaza. There are about two to 3,000 Arab Christians in Gaza. Um, a lot of people, and especially in America, in English, we... We kind of associate Arab with Muslim too. We don't think it as a racial group, but it's not even really a racial group. It's actually an ethnicity and it's an Arab group and an ethnicity, but the ethnicity is larger than the racial group because it's mostly spoken. It's mostly has less to do with your genetic background, but rather if you speak Arabic. So um, a good one, and I got this quote from a gentleman from a great BBC um, uh, kind of feature of him. And he's a, um, he's a pastor at a church there. Uh, In 1948, my family lost a lot of land inside Israel. We have official documents at home to prove it, but we were not able to do anything with them. I think I have forgiven Israel. I'm not able to do it on my own, but by God's grace. Because he has forgiven me, I am able to forgive others. And that's a very noble statement from an Arab Christian in Gaza about what we call, that we're now called the Nakba which I mentioned on the last podcast, but this is a really critical component to understanding the Israel-Palestine conflict is that moment where is what they, Israel calls it the independence war where, you know, upon after Britain, Britain pulls out, they go to war with a lot of Arab states around them. Um, as they announce their independence, these Arab states declare war on them. And part of that fight with these other Arab states includes not, you know, kicking a lot of people off land or people fleeing land during the war uh, that they say, uh, accuse, and there is good historical evidence of this, depending on who you look at, and there's a lot of debate about this, but I think we should listen to the people who are saying, no, my family was on their land, and then Israeli soldiers came, and they said, or uh, Israeli militia, right, a, a private actor came and said, get out of here, or we're going to kill everybody, or they started killing everybody, and we left, and then a lot of people died on after leaving, as they're in the desert, uh, before getting to Jordan, and now they're in a camp in Gaza, or they're in a camp in Jordan, or they're in a camp in Egypt or uh, Syria. So um, <clears throat> th- this is a good example of that. And, the, and the, these these Arab Christ- these Arab Christians face very similar things, and will say some very similar things to the Muslims in their communities as well. Uh, AJ, which is important to know, this is uh, funded by the the Qatar government, uh, has this uh, profile of uh, of Christians in Gaza. I think we should take a look at. I'm in Bethlehem, the city believed to be the birthplace of Jesus. But because Bethlehem is a Palestinian city in the Israeli-occupied West Bank, it's surrounded today by a massive concrete wall, military checkpoints, and illegal settlements. 
It's imposing a system of control that I'm sure Jesus was very familiar of. If he's born today, he would be born on our side of the wall. Over the decades, the percentage of Christians living in Bethlehem and the occupied Palestinian territories has plummeted, rendering them practically invisible. Did you know there were Palestinian Christians before coming here? No. So what happened to all the Christians? To find out, I'm here to ask the Palestinian Christians that remain. Yeah, so there is a shrinking population of them too because a lot of them are leaving. And some of them are leaving too because, you know, when they mean Palestinian Christian, what they mean is non-Israeli citizen. Um, and then what they also mean is like in these areas, these towns that are Palestinian controlled, when a lot of the West Bank itself is supposed to, according to the original deal, according to that post six day war arrangement, uh, is illegal. These settlements are illegal by Israeli standards, but there's no political will to do anything about it. Hmm. Very interesting, complicated, difficult problem. Uh, not to mention international standards, which are also very problematic, right? Because you have this deal that they're trying to make peace with, but Israel keeps violating that to build these settlements, which is very provocative of Palestine is saying, like, we don't have territorial integrity like they literally have and you can find these maps where they'll have this map of the where the where the deal was and then israel builds these giant walls and then tries to annex the stuff outside the walls and you're like this is very clearly an expansionist move mm -hmm. um that is largely ignored by almost everybody uh but it's part of the cause of this conflict there's no doubt about that i mean it doesn't justify anything but it's definitely a component of it well it's it, you know you understand the motivation from it like and that's what really matters here because i remember when when all this stuff initially came down it's like I, I just saw a bunch of people that were just confused they didn't understand why would it why would this happen why would why would you do this well like there's been back and forth that exists here and expansionism that's been happening here like they're, this is the reason why they're doing it. Mm -hmm. Like you have to understand their motive. And a lot of people are just unwilling to actually even kind of grasp with, you know, a different people's way of thinking about things. Right. And, and it also violates our expectations. We, we in the America see it as this is Muslim versus Jewish. Right? Yeah, yeah. And it's not that. That's it's not that at all. Yeah. It, it has a component of that. Like there's a radical Islamic front that Hamas is part of that says, no, this is the Ummah of the uh, of the Islamic community. And we can't if we lose any of it, we're not we're disappointing God. And then there's an Israeli part of that that's like, no, God gave this to the Jews a long time ago and it all belongs to us and all your titles false, no matter how well documented it is. And you got people with little keys to their house that they left in 1948. And they're like, no, this this still works in the door. But someone else lives there now, and I can't go back, right? Or you have people who are, have documentation from the Ottoman Empire, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, or the British Empire saying, this is my house, and yet they can't go there or, or build on it or do anything with it. Um, the basic denial of what libertarians would understand as property rights is, a, is, is the core of this. So if you see that as a core in the religion as... You know, obviously undergirding, but also informing the periphery of it. That's that's the, probably the better way to think about it. So the next question was, what happened in the 90s or thereabouts with the Oslo Accords? Because that's another one of the questions around this. And obviously they beg the question because we have the best listeners of the assassinations following in and around the Oslo Accords because covert ops well, it just makes everything spicy. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Zesty Beverages. They're on a mission to unf*** the standard American diet by crafting drinks with fewer calories and more nutrients from real food. Their lineup of delicious offerings now includes Electric Peak Yerba Mate, postbiotic sodas, keto-friendly, ready-to-drink margaritas, and hard teas. Wondering what a postbiotic soda is? Well, head on over to ZestyBev.com to learn more and find a retailer near you. Once again, check them out online at ZestyBev.com. That's Z-E-S-T-Y-B-E-V.com. So... Uh, Clinton pulled together the PLO leader uh, and the liberal Israeli PM to, to uh, you know, to a summit uh, to work out a two state solution, two state solution. There's always there's there's always this debate, one state solution, or two state solution. We didn't really cover this last time, but the solution is either Palestine becomes its own independent state. That was the original deal that was promised to the Palestinians way back in the day, back in uh, during the Belfont Declaration, I want to say. I think that was World War One and Sykes-Picot came after, right? 
Yeah, that's part of that engagement. And then it became a pal- uh, yeah. British territory. Like they kind of governed it for a while. And then eventually they kind of gave up, gave it to the UN. The UN said, Israel, you get a state. Palestine will figure you out. And then they never really got a state. <laughs> so um, Clinton pulled this together. And, you know, so both sides blame each other for playing a game on this. So if you watch Ben Shapiro's documentaries on this, he'll say Yasser Arafat never wanted peace. He was just he was just yanking our chain. Uh, if you watch the anyone from the Palestinian side, they say, no, the Israelis, you know, they didn't really ever want peace and yada, 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 and all this kind of stuff. Um, and they were like, we agreed to our side, but then they never followed through. And there's a lot of, there's, there's a lot of he said, she said going on there. I'm sure there's truth there somewhere. I'm open to be told about it. There's just a lot of detail that I can't get into here and uh, haven't had the time to, to dive into myself. But one of the things that should, people should be known is that a lot of people are also questioning Clinton, whether or not he really just wanted it to happen or if he just wanted the photo op. Because this is Clinton. Let's keep that in mind. Uh, come on, man. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> look at you like what? That like... <laughs> I did not look at you in any such way. Just like, I look good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... Um, but it was definitely known as both Yasser Arafat, the PLO, and the Israeli prime minister were assassinated afterwards. They both died afterwards. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why peace is so hard to get to now is because now it's kind of like, you know, like, just like, well, what happened? There, do you right? want to die? Yeah. Like, well, sort of like, you know, maybe they had some dirt on the Clintons or something. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, this, this, I, is, I mean, this is, uh, this is like early Epstein era, wouldn't it be? <laughs> maybe, yeah, sad, he, was, right? he probably just got right off it's, it's the... Pretty, it's pretty, there's a lot of evidence that suggests he's Bill Clinton himself. like stepped off the Lolita Express, was like, let's do a peace summit, you know, like that's... No, this would be pre-Epstein time. His, Still, his operation wouldn't have been there that time. Um, the, uh, additionally to that, Hamas did a bunch of terror attacks right after that, which really just killed the whole thing, right? So it's important to note that Amhas played a role in keeping peace from ever being able to happen. Um, and additionally, once that happened, soon after there was an election in the Likud party, that's Benjamin Netanyahu's party, um, came into prevalence and, and, and power and have pretty much been in power consistently since. I mean, out of the last 15 years, Benjamin Netanyahu has been prime minister, 14 of them. Mm-hmm. So... Um, it's hard to, it, 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 we do kind of live in the ashes of that attempt. Uh, there have been other attempts since then. There were attempts in the 2000s, but they never got as far as they did in the 1990s, in part because of the rise of Hamas. So that begs the important question. Mm-hmm. What was Israel's role played in encouraging the rise of Hamas? Now, this is going to sound conspiratorial, but it's not. It's not even close. This is well-documented and well-known uh, it's just a shame that we don't have more consciousness to it. And of course, the gentleman from Texas, no one can do it better than him. Uh, Madam Speaker, um, I rise in opposition to this resolution, uh, not because uh, I am taking sides and, and picking who the bad guys are and who the good guys are, but I'm looking at this more from the angle of being a uh, United States citizen, an American, And I think resolutions like this uh, really do us great harm. Uh, In many ways, what's happening in the Middle East, and in particular with Gaza right now, we have some moral responsibility for both sides, uh, in in a way, because we provide help and funding uh, for both Arab nations and Israel. And uh, so we definitely have a moral responsibility, and especially now, today, the weapons being used to uh, kill so many Palestinians are American weapons, and uh, American funds essentially are being used uh, for this. But there's a political liability, which I think is something that we fail to look at because too often there's so much blowback from our intervention in areas that we shouldn't be involved in. You know, Hamas, if you look at the history, you'll find out that Hamas was encouraged and really started by Israel because they wanted Hamas to counteract Yasser Arafat. You say, well, yeah, that was better then and served its purpose, but we didn't want Hamas to do this. So then we as Americans say, well, we have such a good system, we're gonna impose this on the world. 
We're going to invade Iraq and teach people how to be Democrats. We want free elections. So we encourage the Palestinians to have a free election. They do, and they elect Hamas. So we first indirectly and directly through Israel help establish Hamas. Then we have election. Then Hamas becomes dominant, so we have to kill them. You know, it, it just doesn't make sense. During, during the 80s, uh, you know, we were allied with Osama bin Laden. And uh, we were contending with the Soviets. It was at that time our CAA thought it was good if we radicalized the Muslim world. So we financed the madrasa schools to radicalize the Muslims in order to compete with the, with the Soviets. There's too much blowback. There's a lot of reasons why we should oppose this resolution. It is not in the interest of the United States. It's not in the interest of Israel either. The more you know about history, the more clear it is that our foreign policy is insane. And we need a change in the culture in D.C. around foreign policy. Before the rise of Hamas, the dominance and the dominance that they have since the mid-2000s, Palestinians were largely led by the PLO, the Fatah parties, and other secular groups. Some of these are uber leftist communists. Some of these were also really dangerous, right? And they conducted terror attacks and stuff like that. But they were largely secular and largely political parties. Israel initially supported the growth of Palestinian Islamification um, through these organizations to counterweight them, right? So they would go to mosques, they'd go to religious leaders and give them money and support. Now, there's evidence for this. And I, I wouldn't say this without a lot of evidence because it doesn't sound intuitive to someone who hasn't spent a substantial amount of time looking at U.S. foreign policy, looking at covert operations uh, from Western countries. But this is not surprising at all if you spent any amount of time looking at the British Empire and what they did during their time, much less the things that America has done with the CIA and our intelligence apparatus since then. So we have Brigadier General uh, Yitzhak Segev. Uh, have admitted to financing the Palestinian Islamist movement. Sigev mentioned that Israeli government provided him with a budget that was given to mosques. Uh, Avner Cohen, another former Israeli official, stated that Hamas was, to his regret, Israel's creation. He has warned against playing divide and rule strategy in the occupied territories. So th that's a very tight way to say that there's all those, but I'll, I'll give you some quotes. Um, but it's important to note that for decades, peace activists have pointed out that the competition for Hamas in the 1980s and 90s were jailed uh, and unable to coalesce against Hamas because of barriers imposed to them by Israel. Uh, this is the problem with the, quote, no partner for peace narrative that a lot of pro-Israel folks will say that, you know, as new factions would rise against Hamas, and there are new factions all the time against Hamas, there are factions right now in Gaza uh, is as soon as 2019, Netanyahu speaking to Likud party members said, quote, anyone who, th who wants to thwart the establishment of the Palestinian state has to support bolstering a Hamas and transferring money to Hamas. This is part of our strategy to isolate the Palestinians in Gaza from Palestinians in the West Bank. It's impossible to reach an agreement with them. Everyone knows this, but we control the height of the flame. What does that mean? The grand strategy of the Likud party and not yet Netanyahu is to isolate Gaza from the West Bank. Would it help if I bring up the map again? Does everyone clarify on what I'm talking about here? All right. So the idea is that you have the West Bank, which this just shows the lines of the West Bank, like the uh, post uh, six day war lines, which include uh, this valley right here, which is largely agricultural. Um, and these areas, which are various different communities and cities and towns. Um, if you watched our video last week, I had a different map that really showed where the population centers are here and how many are, um, are, uh, Israeli versus Palestinian. What we've seen is Gaza is, I don't know what better word to use, right? And I, I don't want to feed the anti-Israel point of view with this because I do think it's an indetractable security dilemma that they face with the Palestinians. No doubt about that. But it's kind of like a reservation or an open air prison mm -hmm. or a concentration camp. And I don't mean a death camp. I mean a concentration camp. I mean like what we had with the Japanese. Yeah. Right. Internment camp. Internment camp. We, there yeah. we go. That's that, that was our polite word of 
how to say it. Right. Yeah. And one of the reasons why I showed the video earlier about the Christians in Palestine is because like you can't underestimate what the concrete walls mean. When Charlie Kirk talks about guns hold by a 20 something year old, it's that. And it's robot guns too, mounted on concrete walls, right? And set to shoot people within a certain distance. Um, the West Bank is treated quite differently because you have these scatterings of like secure areas that are Palestinian or uh, that are Israeli and then uh, other areas that are Palestinian all ruled over a different political party, the Palestinian Authority, which is accused mostly by a lot of Palestinians as kind of being a puppet government uh, with a tremendous gang problem. No doubt about that. Like you can, there's some really great reporting from Al Jazeera about the gangs from West Bank and, and their kind of diversity and how different they all are. But you would note that the violence here is very, very different, right? Gaza is the one that has the Hamas and has invaded and killed all these people. But the West Bank, we still had 81 people die last week. Why? All right, I didn't get a very good explanation out of some Googling on that one. Dave, I just sent you a picture of the walls. Yeah, great. If you want to pull that up by any chance. Here's an example of, of, the, uh, of, a, of a wall. Right, This is probably by Gaza, I would guess. But these walls also separate areas within the West Bank. Um, you know, if you look at Bethlehem, for example, it's, it's split off from the other areas. There are roads in the West Bank that are Israeli only. And then the Palestinian roads. Now, I want to be clear. It isn't that Arabs who are, are Israeli citizens are treated different. It's a difference between the ethnic indigenous minority of Palestinians. They are treated differently because they're not citizens of Israel by definition. Uh, we kind of talked about this last time. I don't know how good a job I did explaining it, but I do think it's like before we gave Native Americans citizenship in the Western mind, this kind of might, might, might get the hooks in, but it's not exactly perfect analogy, but you have a indigenous population that existed there before you, you push them out of the way. You now are trying to deal with them after they've lost the war, but still want to conduct asymmetric warfare against you. America eventually assimilated them and put them, put them on reservations, but then made them American citizens, given the right to vote and stuff like that. We are not there with Palestinians. We're several steps back from that. So kind of think of like America in the 1880s is where they're at now, maybe 1890s, maybe 1910s before civil rights acts and before voting acts that gave them the right to vote. Yeah, it seems very, very uh, segregated. But worse than that, too, because the Lakota or the Cherokee didn't have title. The Ottoman Empire had title, mm -hmm. meaning you have a document that says, this is where I lived, right? Not, not as sophisticated as modern documents, but legit transfer of ownership. Now, uh, Native Americans did have treaties and stuff like that that America totally abused and were terrible. So one of the uh, questions is always going to kind of linger in the background. What we, we do, well, what we did was terrible. What we did was the Trail of Tears. What we don't do was pretend like the Trail of Tears didn't happen. What we did do was slaughter people at the Battle of Wounded Knee. Not the battle. It, was not, it wasn't even a battle. It was a protest that turned into a general slaughter. Well, and there's a... Um we were talking about earlier about the, um, what was it called? The Great March of Return. Yeah. Um, like there's a certain analogy there if you want to explain that of how there was a just a straight up slaughter of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip back in like the 2018, 2019. Yeah. Maybe. So one of the questions, and yeah, we can talk about that now, um, especially because it's like, a, this is a particularly difficult problem. So one of the things I've told as I've been looking at this, and I see this online a lot, is like, why don't they have their, their peace figure? Where's their Nelson Mandela? That's a bad analogy because Nelson Mandela was considered a terrorist before he was a national hero. <laughs> um, where's their Martin Luther King? Also considered a terrorist by the government at the time. They had the CIA spying on him and trying to get him to commit suicide. But still, where is their peace movement? Is there the question they're trying to ask? That might work in the West Bank. I don't know. But definitely in Gaza, it sure as heck didn't. Uh, there's a great documentary called Killing Gaza. It's not perfect. Uh, the documentary maker is not a libertarian or conservative or anything close to me on the political spectrum at all. We've got documentaries about why Marxism is great. We disagree philosophically, but she was on the ground during what was called the great March of return, which basically was a protest movement that was largely peaceful where they gathered. Look back at the map. See Gaza right here. So you got Gaza and then you got Gaza city. What they did is they gathered at these little areas right along the border here, slightly violating what Israel has imposed as their boundaries. 
let me be clear. It's not like they're a sovereign country that has an agreement to say we're a sovereign country next to this other sovereign country, like Liechtenstein is with the other countries around them, right? Despite being a city state. Gaza and the Gaza city has their boundaries enforced by a giant concrete wall with robot guns, right? And what happened at the um, the great march of return was a young guy basically said, hey, you know, I was looking at some birds and these birds flew over the, the, the fences and I was like, hey, what if I was like a bird and I could be free to like that too? He wrote this poem. The poem went really viral. And he, he said, you know, out of his sudden famousness, out of this viral poem that he wrote, he said, what if we all just walked to the edge and just stood there and let them see, see you know, us being peaceful? And you would have these tanks and these kids with like slingshots and they'd whip these rocks at these tanks. Uh, some Israeli soldiers were injured, no doubt. But compared to uh, the insane bedlam of 2020, nothing compared to that on the enforcement side. Uh, we got fistfights of soldier of, of people in America just knocking each other out in the streets. Right? Oh, I see. So comparing, uh, sorry, comparing, you know, that movement to like BLM riots and that sort of thing in the U S absolutely not gotcha. even comparable. Gotcha. Right. Especially the, the difference in force and the application of force, because at the end of that, Oh man, I lost the numbers. Do you see the numbers? Uh, 223 Palestinians, 223 Palestinians were shot by Israeli snipers at this time. A substantial amount of them. I don't have the numbers. How many were kids? Did I write that down? Uh, I do not have that in front of me. A bunch of them are kids. A bunch of them are women. A bunch of them are press. I, I, it is it is absolutely horrifying what happened to them. Now, you might say, hey, there was violence in the past, too. Um, you know, peace movements don't happen without sacrificing. Like, get it. Uh, here, I actually got it right here. The um, The Gaza Ministry of Health reported that 969 people were injured by Israeli forces. Among them were 67 children and 223 people hit by live ammunition. That's the numbers that I'm seeing. Yeah, but the description. Children died too. Yeah, there was children that were involved in this. Yes. Yeah, some of them being a lot of them. The the defense being they're shooting in the leg, right? And then what you have is someone whose now leg is ruined for life, right? So the and then other ones, and you can watch Killing Gaza, and you see a 13-year-old kid get shot in the head, and you don't, and you just can't look at it the same after that. I mean, he's got a rock, and he's throwing it at a tank, and he gets shot in the face. And you're just like, you can't, you, there's no justification for that ever. So you, you say that, and, you're, and, you're, and, and that doesn't justify also, it obviously does not justify the hatred of Jews. And it definitely doesn't justify the, uh, the attacks that Hamas did this year. But what it does is it says, hey, there's a certain amount of moral preachiness to, hey, why don't you just be peaceful? Because it's kind of like, why don't you just, you know, sign away your death warrant uh, to live in and open your prison forever? Uh, and there's also kind of like, hey, when we tried, the West did not care. You get the biggest podcast in the world. Abby Martin goes on there and says, hey, I got this documentary. Everyone should check it out. It's got views. Ain't got that many views. Way more people know about October 7th than know about the March of Return. And the perverse incentive of that, as the West does not care when they show up to per, to protest in person, and neither does in Israel, it seems like, because I don't know. I, I looked all over for some evidence of Israeli snipers being prosecuted for this, and I could not find it. Now, it does happen, right? Is, uh, Israeli soldiers, especially in the West Bank, you know, have been held accountable to some things that they've done wrong. Uh, but, man, it is it is a nasty information war out there about that. So um, one more quote on this to point out about the Israeli creation of Hamas. Israeli finance minister Bezel uh, Smotrich in 2015, quote, the Palestinian Authority is a burden and Hamas is an asset. It's Hamas, a terrorist organization. Hamas is a terrorist organization. No one will recognize it. No one will give it status at the International Criminal Court. No one will let it put forth a resolution at the UN Security Council. So what it says is what they're what he's saying, what Yanyahu's saying is like the goal is to keep them in this vague status where they cannot exert monopoly of power, where they don't have a government, because that way we they can't put international pressure on us like we can on them. So essentially, just to put that another way, by empowering Hamas, they're keeping Palestine marginalized as this sort of pseudo state 
that doesn't have official status and can't really defend itself in international bodies whatsoever. Right. And as a foil for peace, very specifically, because if they became a state, you'd have the opportunity for them to do that. Now, there are more complications of peace than that, no doubt. But sure. uh, that is that has been the Likud party's policy since the 70s. Since before Hamas even existed, they were cultivating this and then have supported it all the way up to 2019. So it makes strategic sense, right? Palestine's monopoly of force. If it was a secular government, they couldn't do these things. And then it also, uh, you know, as Hamas repeatedly killed people who made plays for peace, they've only entrenched that, right? So when he says we're going to control the height of the flame, what they didn't anticipate was blowback. You know, you, like, like Ron Paul was just saying, you partner with somebody, you encourage radical Islam, and then it blows back in your face in ways that you can't predict. Well, and I feel like that's just, that's only happened time and time and time again. At this point, we should, it's surprising to me that that's not a known quantity amongst the decision makers in the Israeli government, that that's not a known quantity to Benjamin Netanyahu. Like, is he, or is he just kind of willfully ignorant to that because there are other motives, other incentives to keeping this conflict going. Well, it, and it's that, but it's also, it's, it's an exasperating problem, right? The population growth is a huge one for them, right? The bigger Gaza gets, the more people who live there, the, the more a one state solution can't work because you have a one state resolution, um, one state solution. Then if you get all those people into the state of Israel and they can all vote, then they can vote in a, a majority Muslim government. Well, and also the problems with the one state solution in general is like, you're just you're having just this democratic process where you're just going to have one group of people exerting their will on the other group of people. Like it's not going to ch like it's going to just stew up resentment. You're going to end up just having civil war um, in the long run for that. I, I, I don't I, I've never really seen how a one state solution could ever possibly work in this um, environment. Yeah. And, and what's worse is that Hamas, the other ones were deadly, but Hamas is more deadly. As demonstrated by last week. Mm -hmm. Right. With a bigger. If they were a secular group that was running it, there would be less reason for the entire Muslim world to see them as like them, right? If they're a bunch of commies, you know, running or a bunch of liberals, it'd be a very different dynamic. And additionally, that Hamas has no incentive for peace because they're the ones who see this as a religious war. So you keep the religious war ones in power, then you have a, a forever enemy. Mm -hmm. hmm. Um. And it keeps getting worse, right? 2009, 2012, 2014, every year it gets worse. The Islamist is the radical Islamification of the Gaza, Gaza Strip. So then the question is begged, and we didn't really get in this last time, and I want to make sure we hit it, which is why would some in Israel not want a peaceful solution, right? You got the two solutions, you know, uh, two states, or you have a single state solution. Well, one is religious reasons, right? Uh, which is God gave them the land, Right. Uh, the cards are dropped uh, when pro-Israel people like Shapiro make up histories by omission. Right. If you have somebody when you're doing your historical research on this and they don't mention the Nakba, you are being manipulated. If they justify the Nakba by saying, well, you know, the U.N. said we're, we get to be a, a, an Israeli state so we can do whatever. It's like <laughs> that's not how it works, man. Like morals aren't determined by the U.N. Um, things like that. Right. So there's a religious reason and there's like a major problem with that. But that's like, that's still a minority, although Israel does seem to be heading in a more conservative, more right-wing solution or a uh, direction. Um, it's better to eliminate a security threat than tolerate it nearby. Now that's just a true truism of the world, right? If you got someone who wants to end you, it's best to end them than to let them near, live nearby. So therefore, there's a lot of people on the right who don't want a peaceful solution because of that, right? They don't want a two-state solution because then it gives them standing to have a military and stuff like that. If you are a small business owner looking for exponential growth, you have to connect with Adam Thune at Intellectual Patriots. He will revolutionize your business game and help you get to the next level. Adam can streamline your business practices and advertising strategies to improve your bottom line. His expertise in data engineering means he can build you the systems you need to collect and analyze market data. His mission is to provide you with invaluable insights to fuel your success. From grant writing and business proposals to digital systems integrations, even AI management, Intellectual Patriots is a one-stop shop for cutting-edge solutions. Don't wait another second. Visit intelpatriots.com to learn more. That's I-N-T-E-L patriots.com. So the other one is the West Bank, right? 
you don't have to worry about Gaza. You isolate Gaza and then you break apart with the West Gate with the sediments, right? So you build a sediment as Israeli roads only. You build checkpoints in the West Bank for Palestinians to travel on to get to the West Bank to, to protect the Israeli areas. 90%, and this is according to international NGOs, 90% of building permits by Palestinians are denied when they try to build on the land. They have their buildings knocked down, right? So you kind of stop them from building in the West Bank. You expand. Uh, and then when violence happens, like they move the lines, right? Um, Benjamin Netanyahu actually calls this applying sovereignty to more land. He has a, you know, Orwellian euphemism. But the UN, UN calls it annexation, and it's supposed to be internationally illegal. So if Palestine was a state, they couldn't do this. Their whole solution for the West Bank falls apart. So, like, there isn't really an angle for the West Bank that is very clear because it's just Swiss cheese at this point. In fact, there was... Um, a, a Palestinian uh, and, you know, diplomat at a UN, you know, debate about this whole thing uh, on a on a peace deal, and he basically said, "How are we supposed to have peace when they build all these settlements here? We need a contiguous landmass to have a country." Um, and then why wouldn't Palestine have peace? Right? We didn't really cover that. Well, one, they have religious reasons, right? They have the House of Uman stuff we talked about earlier. They have righteous indignation at the loss of what they see as their land. Right. So there's a generational thing going on there. And I talked about the keys and I talked about the all, all the building, um, uh, like the, the title that they have. But the other part of that is they have nowhere else to go. They're a second class citizen if they go anywhere else. They're you know, they see it as if they go anywhere else, they're signing the death warrant on the Palestinians as a culture, as a people group. OK, so. The next one is the media narratives that came out this week. Um, the Hamas is ISIS. Narrative narrative is continuing. Um, so to be clear, ISIS and Hamas have persecuted each other repeatedly. I didn't yeah. really mention that last time. Yeah, they have nothing to do with each other. Yeah. The, well, I, I think they're trying to make it like they're like similar entities. Like they do. They serve the same purpose. I think that's what they're trying to make it out. But it's not like... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, obviously they hate each other though. Yeah, uh, BB came out and he said that the Hamas is part of the axis of evil with Iran. Hamas is ISIS because they also do evil things, like you said. Yeah. Um, this, yeah, yeah, they're right. This has made it more clear, right? The it was got quote the West coalition bombed ISIS out of existence. We should do the same with Hamas. Uh, that's the arising narrative. Another way to justify bombing lots of civilians, right? Because you're saying, well, we bombed lots of civilians in Syria, so therefore it's worth it. Uh, they even ruled out George Bush to make this point. I don't know if you guys saw that. I didn't. Yeah, well, Georgie came out. Yeah. He's got a good track record on this. Yeah. <laughs> w. <laughs> they got George Bush coming out. They're sending Biden into Israel. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's good over It's going well over here. Yeah. Got all the, the good stars on this issue. So you have Iran as the ultimate enemy, right? Uh, there's still no evidence that they planned the attack beyond the Wall Street Journal story. Uh, and this is like saying France is at war with Russia uh, because it supports Ukraine with funding. Obviously not something that we usually use on international terms. Um, since World War I, we've been treating people who fund other countries in war not the same as combatants. Um, but the neocons are going to throw that out and they're going to say, this is, this is what we're doing. Um, yeah, but one of the good sides is that we do have Biden came out and said Palestine is not Hamas. So that's good. Good job, Biden. <laughs> but that's all he said before muttering to himself and wandering around the stage. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there are some interesting things with that. Um, oh, really? I was just kidding. Yeah, well, he had, he had some really cringy it's remarks. It's very uh, memeable, some of the stuff that's come out recently with it. His, like, droopy chin balls. Um, <laughs> Droopy yeah. chin balls. Let me give you an example it's of the a counter of a argument. And this is from the Israeli um, president. We are working, operating militarily according to rules of the international law, period. Unequivocally. It's an entire nation out there that is responsible. It's not true. This rhetoric about civilians not, we, we're not aware, not involved, it's absolutely not true. They could have risen up. They could have fought against that evil regime, which took over Gaza in a coup d'etat. But we're at war. We are at war. We're at war with at our, we are defending our homes. We're protecting our homes. That's the truth. 
And then when a nation protects its home, it fights. And we will fight until we break their backbone. So the important thing there is that bit on this whole like civilian versus Hamas thing. That's just not how it is because we're at war. Um, that's the that's the real problematic mental model going on in Israel right now. There's just so much here. It's a little overwhelming, to be honest. Oh, sorry. It's like, no, no, no. I mean, and it's not a critique of you at all. It's just, it's a, it's a critique of situation. It's so dense. It's so longstanding. There's so many different factors. I mean, the only thing that it really, it draws me back to is Ron Paul's speech from the floor of Congress. Like, we just need to get the heck out of there. Yeah. We need to not, we need to support peace for both sides. And, and not just because it's politically complicated, but just from like a human standpoint, right? I mean, the thing that kind of troubles me the most about what we're seeing happen right now is how people are so quick to throw out their humanity in favor of rage on behalf of the side that they've, that they've aligned with, right? Just willingness to, you know, support things or implicitly support things, maybe without directly saying them that, they wouldn't in any other circumstance that people are so, you know, revved up right now to, to suggest things that I think in a, in a sane frame of, of mind, they wouldn't. Right. And it's just, it's, well, it's, I don't know. It's interesting to me because it's like, there's all these, this biblical context around, you know, this area. And it's like, it almost feels like we're at the stage where, you know, we're like just pre Noah's Ark where we need to just flood the whole thing and start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, I, I think, I think the more accurate would probably be revelation, right? Cause everything's supposed to come surround itself around Israel and all that stuff. Right. I think there's probably a lot of parallels you could draw and maybe we should have a biblical scholar on the show to like, you know, walk us through all the, all the ways this is the end times or something, but I don't know. It's just, it's just kind of sad. Cause I, I feel like people are better than this, you know, like on all sides. Not, not pointing fingers at anybody. I don't know if they are. <laughs> well, I'm an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, this, is a, this is tribal warfare, right? People yeah. are seeing this in collective mindsets. That's why, you know, one of the things I advocate for is, like, be a methodological individualist about this. Like, if you see this as collective actions, it's really easy to justify the slaughtering of people who are innocent, right? So boiling it down to, down to individuals very quickly becomes... We need to go after those guys in Hamas who did this. And then afterwards, after the success and Israel gets its revenge, you got to do something. You can't let the status quo continue. You got to do something. And that also requires, you know, the Palestinians to take the L or something, right? They have to value the future bet more than they do the justice of the past. And as long as they continue like this, their children are going to grow up in this terrible situation. And the trick is, and one of the things as the longer I look at it, the more I see people saying like the great, the great, the great weapon of the Palestinians, because they had no weapons, is the womb of the Palestinian mother. And I can't understand the place that you would get to, you would say, what we're going to do to fight is we're just going to keep having kids as long as it takes until we get our land back, our house back, or, or the thing we have back. And, and what that means is you condemn those children for a lifetime of living in the Gaza Strip, which is bad. Not a good place to live, guys. And you can find a lot of documentaries that show it. We just don't, we can't show everything on this. Like, well, a lot of the long-term game here does seem to be the birth rate stuff, right? Where, like, I, like I was just in Spain, and I was seeing that apparently the uh, Muslim birth rate is 72 uh, in Spain, and it's supposed to, within the next two years, Spain's going to be a majority Muslim nation. Mm. And it's just like all the other groups are below replacement. So, it, you, you know, when you see that happening across, like the just keep having babies thing on the long term element is like there's going to be a population collapse in all of these other groups around here. And that maybe that is, you know, that there that's an aspect of the long term game right there. Um, which is a heck of a problem for Israel, right? Because they have this, this contradiction that they've never really reconciled, which is how do you be an ethnostate while being a democracy simultaneously? Mm -hmm. And I mean that technically, right? I mean that in the Richard Spencer way. I mean that in the, the goal is to have a country for the Israelis. And I get it, right? I mean, after we talked about it last time, but I just want to make this absolutely clear. Like 
last time we talked about the not uh, the uh, the pogroms in Europe and these spontaneous groups of like militias of Europeans just going around killing Jews, and it was terrifying and ter- and horrible, and all these Jews would die, and the government would sanction it. And then you have, you know, Israel saying, we got it. we're going to have our own country. Now, it's understandable that the Palestinians are saying, well, let's put that country in Africa or in America or in Germany or anywhere but here because we live here. And you're like, you know, I get that too. I really do. I can understand that because I, I start with the fundamental axiom of that you mix your labor with the land. That's your land. Right. And you pass that on to title to someone else. That's their land then. And you can't just take it just because according to some, that God told you you could um, a couple thousand years ago. I remember uh, Dave Smith in one of his specials had a funny joke about how the real solution is that we have to move Israel to Canada. You just put it up in northern Canada. They start a bunch of businesses up there, and Canada probably wouldn't even notice for like a decade that they're up there. (laughs) (laughs) Move Israel to Canada. Um, One of the the big questions I kind of have on the future, and this is more of an America question, much more about the American right wing, is I've been really much, I've been very much watching who on the right is kind of where here, who's just like all in for Israel, who's kind of taking a more Charlie Kirk approach like this, like we showed earlier, and uh, kind of being a little bit more arm's length. And I'm very curious to see, because we're seeing a lot of anti-war settlement and American America first policy uh, over the last few years. And I'm wondering where the dividing line among the American right actually lies here and, yeah. and where it will kind of stick in the aftermath of all this. It's a, it's a very open question. Uh, a lot of developments still have. We see, we've got our boy Vivek. That's about it as far as I can tell. Mm-hmm. Everyone else is a libertarian or a liberal that has any point of this that's not America needs to do everything they can to support Israel, yeah. as far as I can tell. And, and don't get me wrong, I think that's an okay position to the degree that you're not getting us into World War III. Yeah, I, I'm, I, like, I understand where the, the boomer politicians stand because um, they're still wrapped up in their old school mindset around this, right? But I, I'm very much curious about just like the population in general, the yeah. voters of the Republican Party. Like, yeah. I'm curious where this ends up lying. It is interesting that it's like Charlie Kirk, a young guy, and Vivek, a young guy. Yeah. You got like Tim Cast, for example, t- having on like Max Blumenthal. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there's a lot of where it's all going. That's a good question. Yeah. So uh, we do have, a, we've almost ran out of time. Um, we do have two more stories to cover quickly. Uh, we have the judge imposes, imposes gag order on Donald Trump in the DC trial. Now to be clear about this, this was seen and covered by some to say that this was like a general gag order. You can't campaign now. Uh, according to what I read is that the judge imposed the gag order to talk about the trial uh, and talk about the people in the trial. So one of the specific things that I read on the write-up from Politico, which we'll link uh, for you to take a look at, is it mentions specifically that his, I don't know how else to say it, I'm going to say it, we, we try not to cuss, but his talking shit about people in the trial was one of the things that they cited. They're like, <laughs> they're like we just talks a lot of trash to everybody in the trial, and that kind of taints the public against the trial. And so part of the justification here is his trash talk is too good so they got to they gotta keep <laughs> doing it. I mean, if he is good at anything, it's, it's talking <laughs> He's trash. got the trash talk down. <laughs> it, it is crazy to me that this is something that in America you're allowed to do. Like, you're supposed to be innocent until proven guilty. And then you have a court just saying, you can't talk about what's going on, right? You can't really defend yourself in the public eye. Um, that's That's the interesting thing about yeah. this to me. It's not unstandard to have criminal trials, right? Because it's not like, this is a this is a pretty big deal, right? It's a felony. So it's not unstandard to have bounds on your liberty surrounding a criminal trial, keep you from talking to juries or keep you from talking to judges or stuff mm-hmm. like that, that would, that might, that might corrupt the process. It's challenging here because he's a presidential candidate though. And, um, both from the execution of justice point of view, right? Because even if, say for example, you're doing the thought experiment and you, and you de-emotionalize everything, you de-partisanize everything, you just said this incredibly popular guy who did something wrong and you want to you find out if he's, if he's you know, guilty or not. You'd want to do something to keep him from being able to control the process with his bully mic, right? That's the best way to articulate their point of view on it. That said, you know, 
Uh, yeah, Trump. yeah. No, there's supposed <laughs> to be a spirit of, you know, an alleged spirit of innocent until proven and guilty and all that stuff, right? Yeah. Like, that's kind of the whole thing is like, just throw that out the window. That's not, obviously, that's not the case. Oh, yeah. And right? a lot of this is is specifically to try him in the public eye. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and that's what, that's what most of these, of like, happens. most of these big cancellations that have happened, like, whether they're legal, like, legal stuff or just, like, cultural con- cancellations, it's all about the public eye of everything. Mm-hmm. Like, um, yeah, no, it's it's going to be interesting to see how this uh, pans out, because not only do you have the gag order, you also have, like, the trial date set before Super Tuesday, and there's there's clear... Um, there's clear... So that's going to stand, huh? The The trial date? the day before super tuesday that's it my understanding it's gonna yeah wow yeah that 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 to me was like okay this has to be like they have to be like joking or something but no okay so we also have in our last issue today unless joe you got something on the trump trial and the gag order and that stuff i didn't we didn't get the opportunity to weigh in here i mean if he's into getting pissed on i could see him being into gags and stuff so <laughs> that's all i got i don't know Dirty. I, I didn't have a lot of time to think about that one. Dirty Joe. That was the Russian hoax. <laughs> radical left. Radical that's all, that's all I got. I'm just going to, my, my answer is radical left. <laughs> Moving on. All right. So we got Sarah Huckabee Sanders, and this is the former Arkansas governor, and then I think senator later, the presidential candidate. And then she went on to press secretary, press before. secretary for the president uh, and did a very interesting job. Uh, and now she is the governor of Arkansas and she has just done something interesting with property law in China. I'm announcing that Syngenta, a Chinese state owned agrochemical company must give up its land holdings in Arkansas. Syngenta owns 160 acres in Northeast Arkansas, which it uses primarily for seed research. The company that owns Syngenta, Kim China is also on the Department of Defense's list of Chinese military companies posing a clear threat to our state. Seeds are technology. Chinese state-owned corporations filter that technology back to their homeland, stealing American research and telling our enemies how to target American farms. That is a clear threat to our national security and to our great farmers, especially since the Chinese government enacted a law in 2017 requiring Chinese citizens abroad to collaborate with their country's security officials on intelligence work with no questions asked. This isn't about where you're from. We welcome Chinese Americans, Russian Americans, and anyone else who's given up foreign oppression for American freedom. This is about where your loyalties lie. We simply cannot trust those who pledge allegiance to a hostile foreign power. That's why I signed Act 525, sponsored by Representative McKenzie and Senator Boyd, to ban Chinese and Russian-made drones. Okay, so my question about this, when, when I saw this, I was like, well, I, I just kind of saw the two clear angles here, right? Like, on one hand, we've got the Chinese threat, right? And I put that in quotes for those just listening. Uh, I think that they are an economic, you know, competitor, for sure. And obviously, there's potential for future you know, armed conflict over Taiwan and that sort of thing. But there's a national security threat on one hand of like, should companies that the DOD has said are potential threats to national security be able to own land in the U S but then there's the other side of, well, we're a nation of laws and property rights. Should they not be able to own land, you know, just the same as anybody. So I was curious what your guys thoughts would be on this topic. Is it a national security thing or is it a property rights thing? If they can do this to China, is this a slippery slope to, you know, potentially just stroking a pen and depriving some other entity of their land? What do you guys think? My, my initial thought is like thinking back towards the TikTok stuff that was going on with the attempt to ban it because it's Chinese influencing our kids and things like that. But there's also something to be said too, because I know like Chinese security systems are being sold to a lot of, um, uh, like a lot of different countries, like Dubai is using them, all these all these different countries. And there is kind of this question there of like, how much control are you giving your country to a foreign power, especially when we are effectively in a cold war with China right now, really? Um, so there, there, is, there is that question on the national security issue. Um, I, all these Chinese companies, they do have, like every major Chinese company has a person on the board that is from the CCP, right? 
Um, so you have that influence that is being had there. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. It's just, it's interesting. I don't have any like real thoughts. Like, is it a violation of property rights? Sure. But countries violate property rights all the time. <laughs> it's like, that's not a, I, I don't even, I, I don't even really think about that in terms of this really. Like I, I'm just thinking about the larger game that's being played here. Um, the general advice from a developmental economics point of view is improving countries have property rights. So they're not communists. They're not um, vague property rights where it's like a tribal system of whoever kind of showed up here first and can defend it, gets it, that sort of thing. Uh, where you have title to land and all the stuff that we talked about related to Israel. Um, countries that want to develop have to have that. Countries that want to develop quickly and develop um, aggressively have international investment. If you're poor, one of the best ways to become no longer poor is to allow for international investment. That means other companies from other countries investing by owning capital in your country to make stuff. That is just a heck of a trade-off um, because it can come with abuses, right? Um, great example. There was a point uh, where United Fruit Company owned 70% of Guatemala. And then there was definitely a point, and if you look in the Smedley Butler, one of the most famous you know, military veterans in America of all time, uh, if you listen to um, a lot of the work that's been done to chart the covert history ops of the United States government, it can backfire where the United States government has been, you know, for the sake of American companies doing some very bad things to political actors who would threaten those companies. The easy story to tell in this case is United Fruit, where a center left, you know, movement started up that said, hey, we want land reform and we want to compensate United Fruit, but we want you know, we don't want all of our country owned by one company. Uh, and basically they overthrew that government and, you know, persecuted and or assassinated their way into a 40 year long war uh, in Guatemala over this. So, uh, and, you know, another example, Iran, BP owned all the oil fields. The uh, Shah uh, got overthrown by a democratic revolution. The guy in there said, hey, I'm going to nationalize the oil fields and the CIA and uh, as well as British intelligence got rid of that guy, reinstalled the Shah. And then after a little while later, we have the Khomeini came in and took over from the Shah. Now we have a enemy forever, apparently, in Iran because of that. These have tremendously bad consequences, right? These dangerous, dangerous consequences that can happen um, for those countries that have foreign investment. So I, you don't want to be naive to that, right? Because uh, we definitely know that we can be the aggressors on that in some fronts. Um, and other countries place a lot of barriers in this, but some of them actually do so to their detriment as well when it comes to development, because there are also lots of other development that happens that's quite peaceful and works well. The difference here, though, being, I mean, at least the clearest one I can see is that the United States isn't a developing nation, mm -hmm. right? And so obviously we, we do want to encourage, you know, judicious, careful, you know, foreign investment. But with the situation where the United States finds itself in with regard to China, do we, is that a... Is that a danger potentially to have tremendous to have an, you know potentially you know a competing economy or you know an opposing you know country or an with an opposing philosophy being communism at least in name uh, owning land in our country is that is that a threat and is that a, is that a proper role of government within your you know philosophical worldview well th there is something to be said too because like like what is China's strategy? for themselves on the geopolitical stage right now. Like America's strategy is basically being this mafia like uh, um, like mercenary group and exporting our inflation and our dollars around the world, right? Where China is doing a lot of economic development in developing countries. Like China owns like a lot of Africa. Like they've just been developing Africa like crazy right now. Um, so, and also kind of to Dave's point of what happened in Iran, it was a very similar situation in Iraq is like there was this one, there's this family with major building company, I'm blanking on their name, very, very big power player um, over the last hundred years that uh, was basically building all the pipelines for Iraq and everything. And when everything went down, then Saddam Hussein basically arrested everybody that worked for that company. <laughs> um, but that was his way of kind of ingratiating himself with the Americans back before all the war started. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I, I think there's something to be said about like China's strategy here is like, is this a manipulation tool that they're using um, with uh, 
ingratiating themselves into the American economy like this. Like, you know, they own a lot of our debt, right? Um, Is this a good thing for Arkansas to do or a bad thing? Yeah, so Arkansas is 35th in per capita GDP. If you want that to go up, you need capital. Yeah. You so you think this would probably damage that for them? Yeah, yeah because outside, I mean, uh, the biggest saver in the world is China. Right? One of the biggest capital investments that you can have in the world is China's investment. Now, it's a trade-off. I'm not saying it's necessarily the wrong call. Um, there's a trade-off between national security here, as Kyle was laying out. I mean, I don't want Huawei, you know, technology in my... And then, drone technology that my military is going to use. And that was right? the big that thing with sense. introducing 5G, too, back in the day. Right. I remember during the whole Trump thing and all the conspiracies about 5G? That all had to do with China, too, and, and the security apparatus around it. Right. So yeah. I, I don't, I, I'm not willing to say well, either way. It's, it's hard to predict. I don't really know what the, you know, innovative seed market looks like or how that matters for Nebraska other than that. I know Nebraska is, or Arkansas? Isn't Sorry, it? Arkansas. I had my mouse on Nebraska and that was the problem. So they're 34, not 35, my bad. They're all just states down there in the south. It's all flyover yeah. country. <laughs> Isn't this the second time we've disparaged the good name of the state of Arkansas? I'm the first sorry. time was to say you could marry your cousin there, and actually you can't. You can't anywhere? Oh, you, really? Yeah, no, you can't. So our whole the UK's the Arkansas of Europe was wrong? Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> That's I, had to put a, I had to put a fact check down in the show notes. <laughs> That's right. Oh, man. Sorry, Arkansas. Ouch. Yeah. Sorry, Arkansas. Our bad. Two, uh, yeah, two Operating strikes. Operating on stereotypes. Two strikes. We don't even have a, a, a bathroom in this in this studio. That's how primitive Montana is. Yeah. Joe I'm, rode a horse here. I did. Yeah. That's yeah. we all just operate on stereotypes. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So, anyways, I'm I'm, I'm saying I don't know that, but um, the future is in technology. The future in agriculture is probably in GMOs. Sorry to say that. I know that triggers people, but that's probably how you're going to get higher yields with less land to preserve the natural environment and to create enough food for everybody. Yeah, we have to eat the bugs. Or that's it's that or eat the bugs. Eat the bugs. Uh, and then you know, like if Arkansas wants a part of that, they have to, or they're going to have to allow for foreign investment because so much of those dollars are there. That said, you're right. America is a rich country. We have lots of capital here. There's no reason we can't fund a lot of that here. That said, um, the problem with central planning is that you can't know what the trade-offs are once you make the central plan. So we're doing it now. We're trying a central plan experiment in Arkansas. Maybe all that investment goes to Nebraska. Because you know, God, they it? need it. Yeah, right? They're 35. <laughs> They're gunning for you, Arkansas. Well, look, look where Montana's at. We're, we're 48, guys. Yeah. Oh, shit. Crushing it. <laughs> Wait, that that's... That's not good, Kyle. Yeah, That's not this, good. That'd be low. <laughs> I, know, we're, I know. We're looking for golf scores here. <laughs> All, All right. right. We're running out of time. We we're are out. almost out of time. We, uh, I think we did a, a part three today is, is what was this was. It? I'm was sorry, guys. Two. No, I no, just, I don't think it's a bad thing. Look, there's so much to cover here. It's like we, we could we could dig on this for, for years. Yeah. Stay tuned for part four next time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm hoping we can move on. I'm hoping the war's over by then, but maybe not. Well, and, or inter something interesting, like something else interesting happens elsewhere in the world. Yeah. I don't think we'll have to keep going over the background, though. From here, you know, it's kind of up to our viewers to go out there and research more. Um, I If we wanted to do something like a history of Israel and Palestine, we'd do that in like a monologue going forward. Um, but from here, uh, we'll, we'll just kind of keep people on the updates. Well, if you are tired of us talking about the conflict in Israel and you want to have a say in what we cover on the next show, then please do join our discord where you can have a say in all the things that we talk about and share funny memes and do all the cool stuff that we do for now. That's all we got. We really appreciate you watching and we will see you in the next one. Thanks for tuning in to Human Reaction. Help us fight internet censorship by liking, commenting, subscribing, following, and sharing the show with your friends. To find us around the internet, visit linktree.com slash humanreactionpod.